Before we get into the Season 5 recap of The Handmaid's Tale, if you need a Season 4 recap, I've got you covered. Just hit the tab in the upper right-hand corner. But Season 5 picks up right where Season 4 left off. June gets home, and she's looking in the mirror as she's just covered in blood. She's processing everything that just happened. The fact that she killed Fred, the fact that she's done with him. She's really reliving it all in her head. But when she gets out of the bathroom, Luke notices that she's covered in blood and knows that there's something wrong. He starts chasing after her as she's leaving the house trying to get an explanation until finally she stops and she tells both Luke and Moira, I did it. I finally did it. I killed Fred. They're pretty surprised and they try to get her to come back inside and talk about what she did, but she doesn't. She gets in the car and she drives off. She goes and meets the other women at a diner, the same women who helped her kill Fred. They don't really say anything to her. They just let her eat, and boy does she. A bloodied up June goes in on some pancakes. But as she's leaving, one of the women named Danielle tells her, I got something to show you, and it's in her trunk. It's a bunch of guns. She tells June that she can get more. Daniel then asks June if Nick can help her get to the woman that she wants to kill who's back in Gilead. It's a wife. It's basically her Serena. And June doesn't know, and honestly, June doesn't really care about it. It's not really her problem. When Danielle points out that they can get into Gilead, getting in isn't the hard part, getting out is, June's a little surprised that she wants to go back to Gilead all to get retribution. They start pressuring June, asking, what are we going to do? Because we helped you kill Fred, and he was your monster. We tore him apart for you. Now, it's our turn. And June starts questioning all of this, saying, you're going to leave your family, you're going to leave your husband, and what, to get caught? You know you're going to get caught. But at that moment, the women don't want to hear it. They just want to know how they're going to get vengeance on their monster, just like June just got on Fred. It gets so bad that June annoys the group so much, a girl named Vicky holds a gun at her, demanding that June stay with them. But June calls Vicky's bluff. Vicky shoots a couple rounds into the sky, and at that point, you kind of need to get out of there because that's going to draw some attention. So June gets in her car with the gun she was handed, and she leaves. June drives off because one person that was noticeably absent from this meeting was Emily. So she heads to her house and knocks on the door, and Sylvia answers. She tells her, Emily's not here. She went back to Gilead to fight or go after Aunt Lydia. She didn't do this face to face. She called and told Sylvia this and then said goodbye. She wouldn't even say goodbye to Oliver. June right away says, I can find her. I can fix this. But Sylvia stops her and says, June, she's gone. I've accepted it. I've accepted that I'm never going to see her again. I think you need to, too. June nods and asks Sylvia, if you hear from her, will you tell me? But Sylvia says, no, I won't. And June gets in the car and leaves. She drives all the way to a lake where she once again starts to process everything that she's been through. The fact that she no longer has to deal with Fred. Everything that she did. And then all of a sudden, she sees something in the distance. It looks like a father playing with his daughter in the water. But in reality, what she's seeing is a figment of her imagination. It's Luke playing with Hannah. And she starts getting really emotional, thinking about what's still in Gilead. But June, sitting in the water in the middle of winter, that's kind of a sight. And somebody comes and finds her and starts asking her if she's okay. Eventually, the cops get called and they take her down to the precinct. Because that's kind of crazy. So Luke ends up getting called down there to deal with his wife. But as Luke is making his way to the precinct, word of Fred dying has gotten around. Immigration has to let Serena know. Now, her life is in danger. Whoever did this to Fred will definitely be after Serena, and with Serena being pregnant, it's a risk that nobody's willing to take, so they have to move her. But before they do, they tell Serena, sorry to report, your husband's been killed. And just like June getting really emotional, Serena gets emotional, thinking about all the good times that her and Fred had together, and knowing that it's never going to happen again. When they finally get Serena to a safe location, Mark enters the room, but before he can get a word out, Serena tells him, I want to see my husband's remains. He tells her that he'll try to make that possible, and then she starts questioning how this could have happened. Last she heard, Fred was headed to Geneva. Mark goes on to explain that it was a prisoner exchange, and the last that he saw of Fred, he was fine, but something happened. Serena gets really upset by this. Mark defends his actions, and he goes on to explain that right now, the priority is protecting her and the baby, because two things arrived at the ICC detention center. One was Fred's wedding ring. 
The other was his ring finger. And when Mark tells Serena that, she knows right away who did this. It was June Osborne. A little while after Serena makes this claim, not too far away, Luke arrives at the police precinct. June starts apologizing, putting Luke through this, because she knows that before she showed back up, Luke was in a good place. But Luke tells her, no, I wasn't. I needed you. She then gives Luke an update on the fact that Emily went back to Gilead. And they start talking about how in a weird way you do sort of feel this draw towards Gilead even though you left and you don't want to go back. They then start talking about what June did. And as Luke is trying to tell her, you did nothing wrong. He got what he deserved. June tells him, I'm not going to be able to live like this. I can't just sit back and wait to hear boots on the steps. I have to confess. As Luke is begging her not to do this and to come home and they can talk about it, she just flat out tells the cops, I killed Fred Waterford. Take me in. So they do. And she owns up to everything. But she doesn't get arrested because the cops tell her, you did this outside of our jurisdiction. As far as we're concerned, you're not our problem. So as far as we're concerned, you're free to go. The only thing they charge her with is having one of his fingers on her person. They charge her $88 and she's just going to pay it online. And let me tell you, when Serena finds out that June admitted to it and isn't getting charged, Oh, she does not take it well. Just like with June, Mark explains that June did this in sort of a no-man's-land situation, so there's nothing the Canadian government can do. As they're a few feet away from Fred's remains, he starts telling Serena that right now what she should focus on is her new life in Toronto with her and her child once the charges are resolved. But she shoots back, how am I ever going to feel safe? Are you going to protect me? Are you going to protect me like you did Fred? She starts really giving it to Mark until finally she leaves. But once she does leave the place where they're holding Fred's remains, she sees how unalone she really is. Because there are a bunch of people outside of the facility that are holding candles in Fred's honor. They're supporting Serena, even though they live in Canada. And they're giving her words of encouragement. Right before she does get in the car to go, she tells Mark, I want to bury my husband in Gilead. He was a commander. He deserves respect. Mark starts to tell her how difficult that's going to be. And Serena says, Mr. Tuello, my husband was murdered and I'm asking to bury him. Any civilized country would have the decency to allow that. And Mark does agree to it. So he says, I'll make some calls. Meanwhile, his murderer arrives back at her place and Luke doesn't really quite know what to do. He tells her that he thinks everyone could use a drink. So he goes in the kitchen to grab some wine and he sees Moira and Moira asks how she's doing and Luke acts like she's fine, but Moira says she's not fine, Luke. And the way that Luke looks at it, she's back at home, so he's taking that as a win. That's when Moira goes to check on June, and June gives her the update on Emily. Moira actually knew about it and says, believe it or not, it's kind of common. She goes to excuse herself to get Nicole a bath, and June says, I can do it. But Moira tells her, June, I don't feel comfortable with you around children right now. And June understands why. There's then a knock at the door, and Luke goes to answer it, and it's Mr. Tuella, there for June. First thing she asks is, are you here to, like, arrest me? And he explains, no, no charges today. June then apologizes for Tuella for kind of playing him, and then asks, how did Serena take it? And Tuella tells her she's scared. Mainly, she's scared of you. And scared can be very dangerous. To which June replies, that woman is always going to be dangerous. He then tells her, I'm pretty sure you scared Gilead as well. A handmaid killing her commander. I don't think they'll be able to let that stand. He then goes to leave, but before he does, he tells her, well done. You did something terrible that needed to be done, and that man's going to rot in hell. This affirmation is something that June kind of needed. She walks back in the house, goes to the bathroom, and there's Moira, Luke, giving Nicole a bath, and June joins in. In episode two, Mark got the okay to send Fred's remains to Gilead. He, along with Serena, hop on a plane and they go there. As soon as they arrive, they're greeted by Commander Lawrence and Nick, who is obviously now a commander. They get pleasantries out the way, but it is painfully awkward. Commander Lawrence does let her know that the Putnams will be hosting his wake. She then asks about the church where the ceremony will be held, and when they go there, she realizes it's really small. The thing is, they're trying to keep this funeral hush-hush because Commander Waterford is looked at as a traitor. When Serena questions both Nick and Lawrence on why the church is so small, they tell her that it's out of respect for her. 
But the good thing is he will still be buried where the other revolutionaries are buried. This, however, is completely unacceptable to Serena. She questions why somebody who helped found this country is being treated like this. And then she starts questioning how exactly he ended up dying because she knows that June Osborne could not have acted alone. She knows that these two had something to do with it, although there's plausible deniability, something that Lawrence is absolutely reveling in. He's playing dumb, but he's doing so in a way of a man who is all but admitting guilt but also knows there's nothing she can do about it. Nick, on the other hand, is being more convincing with his denial. Serena then asked both of them, could you imagine what the other commanders would do if they found out that you helped a former handmaid kill her commander? I'm going to implore you to give Fred the burial that he deserves. Commander Lawrence, though, reminds her that he's just one commander, and Nick, while he's on the come up, he's still very young. There's only so much that they can do. But she shoots back a, you'll find a way. They then get ready to head over to the wake at the Putnam's, where they will be joined by a couple of handmaids. Janine and Esther. Janine is right back to being a follower of Aunt Lydia's. She knows how this game works. Esther, though, doesn't. And Esther kind of acts like Janine did when she first arrived. Esther has no interest in being a handmaid whatsoever. It's become obvious. So Aunt Lydia pulls Janine aside and tells her that the Putnams are looking for a new handmaid, and Esther fits that description. They're going to introduce Esther to the Putnams today, but... It's up to Janine to kind of convince her to get on board with this whole thing. The incentive for Janine is the fact that Janine will be able to finally see her daughter again. And Janine also knows that if Esther is posted there, it'll give her a better chance of seeing her daughter even more in the future. So Janine tries to convince Esther to get on board with this whole Handmaid's Tale business. The Handmaids then head over to the wake, where Serena's already arrived. She says hi to the other wives. They admire her baby bump. But eventually, Commander Lawrence pulls her aside and says, no go. I asked the other commanders, and they said no, mainly because they don't care what a woman thinks. Now, Mark doesn't hear any of this conversation. Even though he's supposed to be by Serena's side the entire time, he's pretty much kept in the entryway of the house. He does at one point get to see Nick, and he does want to talk to him, but this just isn't the right time to do so. That's actually when the handmaids arrive. Now that they're out of their barracks, Esther wants to do something, like escape, but... Janine tells her, everybody who tries to do something ends up dead. Your best bet is just to follow the rules. Esther then gets introduced to Mrs. Putnam, who makes comment on how young she looks. But Aunt Lydia does her best to sell Esther to the Putnam family. That's when Janine's daughter runs out. Janine gives her a big hug, says hello to her. But after a couple of minutes, Mrs. Putnam has the child go away. And Janine says to Mrs. Putnam, you have a lovely daughter. And Mrs. Putnam says, thank you. I thank the Lord for her every day. She looks like she's about to walk away, but then she turns back and says, I also thank the Lord for the people who brought her to me. Acknowledging that Janine had a huge part in this. It makes Janine feel pretty good. It's now time, though, for Esther to meet Mr. Putnam. Aunt Lydia escorts her into the room with him and a bunch of other commanders. And when Aunt Lydia leaves, she has a look of guilt in her face because she has an idea of what might happen. And what ends up happening is Mr. Putnam feeds Esther some chocolate. On the surface, it doesn't sound that bad, but it's pretty demoralizing. The way he does it, it's just creepy, and it makes Esther feel the same. When she's finally able to get out of there and the handmaids leave, Esther turns to Janine and says, I don't want to be posted. But the only advice that Janine gives her is, be nice to your commander. You'll get pregnant faster that way. Because being pregnant is your only protection. When they finally arrive back to the handmaid's barracks, Esther is able to get Janine alone. She comments on how difficult it must be to see her daughter and not be able to take her with her. And Janine says, yeah, you kind of get used to it. But it doesn't seem like Esther wants to get used to that. She then pulls out a bunch of chocolate that she stole from the Putnam household, and she offers some to Janine. The two women start eating the chocolate. Janine starts talking about what it's like to be pregnant, how much better you're treated. And then all of a sudden, Esther says, you know, I didn't like you when I first met you. And it turns out, I was right. Janine's pretty confused. And Esther starts saying how Janine is using her, just like Aunt Lydia used her. And in reality, none of them care about her at all. They don't care about what she wants. Janine's just using all of this to get closer to her child. Janine right away says, no, that's not true. I'm trying to help you, just like June helped me. But Esther says, you are no June. All of a sudden, she starts coughing up blood, but she's doing so with a smile on her face. She says, I'm going to make June proud. And as Janine starts screaming for help, she too starts coughing up blood. Because whatever Esther did to that candy, 
It's got both of them coughing up a lot of blood. When Aunt Lydia eventually comes in, she's concerned because she's got two handmaids writhing on the ground with a face covered in blood and no answers in sight. But while Mr. Putnam's former handmaid and possibly his new one were dealing with that medical issue, he gets approached by Serena. He's in a room with all the other commanders when she just barges in. She makes a plea to all the commanders to honor her husband the way that she thinks he should be honored. Have a public funeral that's broadcast throughout the nation. Commander Putnam says, why would we do that for a traitor? And it's Commander Lawrence who comes to her defense by saying, I've watched you guys squander opportunities before, and I'm not going to let you do it again. The mourning of one of our peers is an opportunity that we cannot waste. Commander Putnam asks, how would that make us look? Honoring a traitor? And Nick pipes up and says, it would make us look merciful. Serena then leaves the men to discuss it. And a few hours later, Commander Lawrence comes and finds Serena and tells her, I was able to convince them. They're going to have a public funeral for Fred. It's going to be broadcast. And the way he was able to do that was basically because he's a man and she's a woman. The two then sit down and start talking about a guest list. And this gives Mark enough time to sneak off and have that meeting he wanted to have with Nick. They do so covertly in the woods. And Nick asks how June is, how Nicole is. And Mark gives him an update but then says, you know, there is a world where you could see your daughter. The way that you've been able to rise up through the ranks while also helping June, that's a skill. I know you got a complicated past, but America can be very forgiving. If you make amends and gain us some visibility and play your part for a while, this could work. I'd like to help you and your daughter. Really, we could help each other. And while Nick doesn't commit to anything, he does say, I'll keep it in mind. The next day, the funeral procession is held. But while Fred's funeral is going on up in Canada, June can't stop thinking about the fact that Serena knows it was her who killed Fred. She's not worried about it. She just can't get it out of her mind because she's proud of it. She then remembers, though, that she's got a gun in the car. So she runs and grabs it. And In the middle of the night, she buries it in the backyard. When everybody eventually does get up, her, Luke, Moira, Rita, they have a small get-together where Luke pulls out some board games and one of them is Scrabble. It immediately triggers a memory of her playing Scrabble with Commander Waterford. So she gets pretty silent. And when Rita has to go in the kitchen to grab some bread, she uses it as an excuse to get out of the room. She starts telling Rita how Serena went off to the States, and she starts wondering what she's up to. She knows there's got to be an ulterior motive to this. The thing is, Rita doesn't really care. She doesn't want to talk about Serena. But June persists. She asks Rita, do you remember the time she hit you? I was pregnant and she wanted to hit me, but she couldn't, so instead she hit you. And all the while, Moira is trying to get June to shut up. Rita is telling June that she doesn't want to talk about it, but June just doesn't care. Until finally Rita says, you know, I know I wasn't a handmaid, but I deal with what happened every single day. It causes June to realize what she's doing and she apologizes, but the damage is done. It's too late. Something is clearly up with June. So later that day, Luke goes to check on her. And he asks, how are you doing? But she doesn't answer the question. She says, you know, I do have something to tell you. Serena knows that I'm the one who killed Fred. Because I sent her his ring finger and I sent her his wedding ring. She starts talking about why Serena went to Gilead. There's got to be an ulterior motive. And Luke stops her and says, stop, you're obsessed. I mean, come on, you sent her his finger? He tells her, you know that that's not going to get Hannah back. And she says, yes, Luke, I know it's not going to get Hannah back. I'm fully aware of that. Luke realizes what a volatile situation his wife is in. So he gets close to her and says, you got to be here. You got to be here for me. You got to be here, Nicole. You got to be here for our family. Serena's gone. And she's probably terrified of you. She can't get to you. This little pep talk does help June. And the next day, the two head off on a day date to go to the ballet. They seem to have a good time. And as June is leaving... She kisses Luke. It seems like she's starting to feel like her old self. Until she looks up at the monitors in downtown Toronto and all of them have the same thing on them. It's the funeral of Fred Waterford. You see Serena, you see the procession, and then you see one little girl get up and hand Serena flowers. And it's Hannah. Hannah is standing right next to Serena and June is watching all of it go down. As June has a scowl on her face looking at the screen, Serena gives the faintest smile because she knows that somewhere June is watching this. And while June might have taken Fred from her, 
She is standing next to the thing that June cares about the most, her daughter. In episode three, June and Luke head back to the house, and they are pissed off on what they just witnessed. But one thing that June is really focused on was the color that Hannah was wearing. It was like this purplish plum color, and June is unfamiliar with it. She's concerned. She doesn't know what it means, and she's trying to think of a way to find out. She realizes she's got to talk to Nick. Nick would know Nick was there. Moira says that there's a group near the border that's had luck with getting messages into Gilead. And June gets really upset that this is the first time she's hearing about this. But Moira tells her, these are the last people you need to be around. They're refugees with a death wish. They're just waiting to get caught. She does, however, agree to set up a meeting. Not for June, but for Hannah. And the next day, she goes and meets with this girl named Lily in a parking lot along with June. Right away, Lily recognizes June. She thanks her because Lily's one of the girls that was traded for Waterford. It's pretty clear that this woman idolizes June. They then start talking about what kind of message they need to get in. Unfortunately, Nick really isn't the Jezebel's type, and that's where most of Lily's contacts are located. Not to worry, there are other ways, but it's going to take time. They head off to Lily's outpost, which is really a cabin in the middle of the woods near the border. There's a decent amount of people there, all armed, all with guns. Lily tells June that this is going to take a little bit. They can get around the Gilead services by using sat phones, but doing that and waiting for the message to trickle down to Nick, she might be there a while. When June and Moira enter the cabin, one of the things they're really impressed with is this wall of photos of all these women that they help get out of Gilead. But Lily focuses on another wall with more pictures. And those are all the women who they didn't get out of Gilead. Those who died trying to get out. As Moira and June are looking over the photos, Lily says, It's a shame, but those who are associated with May Day know the risk. And this is a shock to June and Moira. They thought they made up May Day. They thought May Day was completely fake. And now they have a stranger telling them that, no, it's real. Lily goes on to explain that May Day is everywhere. It can be as small as one or two people, and it can be as big as a couple hundred. She doesn't know where the other Mayday outposts are. It's just safer that way, but she has her inner circle, and that's Mayday. And when June tells her that she thought she made it up, Lily says, well, then it turns out you're Mayday too. Because they have so much downtime as they wait for Nick to get the message, they decide to help out. Moira and June start sewing some items into clothing that they're going to sneak over the border. In June's case, it's some arsenic that's going to go to a D.C. commander and hopefully it kills him. They then, though, stop because they hear a commotion outside. And it's a guy that looks like he's dressed up as an eye. And he's standing there screaming at the women that he's friendly, but they've got guns pointed at him and they're not so sure. On top of that, it's taking him a while to give them the password that indicates that he's friendly. Until finally a woman pops up out of the woods and yells it. She explains to all of May Day that this guy ended up saving her. He's a friend. This woman who had just escaped Gilead is taken in by the group, but the guy turns around to leave, and June says, wait, you're going back in? And he explains, yeah, I am. I have a wife and a kid. I can't abandon them. After that, everybody just turns in for the night, and June waits to hear from Nick. But in Gilead, June's former protege, Janine, isn't doing so hot. She's in the hospital, and she's unresponsive. So is Esther, but Aunt Lydia doesn't really care about Esther. She's more pissed off on what Esther did. So she doesn't care if she lives or dies, really. But Janine, she is very upset about. They've always had this weird relationship, and Aunt Lydia does not want to see Janine go. She starts praying to God, asking God to forgive any mistakes she made that led them to this point. And then she gets an idea having Mrs. Putnam show up. Janine showing up at the hospital worked so well for the baby back in the day that maybe it'll do the same for Janine if her baby shows up. Mrs. Putnam, who always liked Janine, obliges, and she arrives at the hospital with the baby, and she starts talking to an unresponsive Janine that she won't be forgotten if she dies. That Mrs. Putnam will tell the baby where she got her smile from, where she got her kindness from, And she gets so close that the baby even touches Janine. And this appears to work. Because the next day, Aunt Lydia goes to check on Janine, and she's out of her hospital bed. She woke up. She's still got a long road of recovery ahead of her, but she's much better than she was the previous day. 
While Janine is recovering, so is most of the country after the funeral for Fred. That whole song and dance was big for Gilead's PR department. The day after, Tuello goes to Serena's hotel room to meet with her, and he explains that the heads of Gilead must be very happy with her. She thanks Tuello because she does realize that Gilead looking good probably doesn't sit well with Tuello's bosses, but he says, I'm just doing my job, and explains that allowing her to do this is kind of repayment for the botched prisoner exchange of Fred. She then tells him, though, that he should probably head out. She doesn't want anyone getting the wrong idea that he's there for other motives, i.e. spying. So he leaves and tells her that he'll be by later that day to pick her up and take her to Commander Lawrence's place. And he does just that. But when they arrive, Commander Lawrence tells him that they don't really take too kindly to spies, so he's going to have to sit outside and wait for Serena. Tuello completely understands and tells Lawrence, you know, I do want to talk to you, though. I think we have a lot in common. To which Lawrence just cracks up laughing and closes the door in Tuello's face. The reason why Serena headed over to Lawrence's is because Lawrence is hosting a dinner. It'll be attended by Serena, the Mackenzies, who are Hannah's parents in Gilead, and Nick, who is with his new wife, Rose. And Rose is a very old family friend of the Mackenzies. Commander Mackenzie is friendly with Rose's dad, so they have a good relationship. But Nick showing up with a new wife is a surprise to Serena. She just had no idea about this. The group then sits down to eat, and after some pretty boring dinner conversation, they get into the topic of June Osborne. The Mackenzies are in agreement that June did not work alone. What Commander Mackenzie's heard is she actually had a lot of help in the matter. Serena's kind of surprised that the Mackenzies know all this information about Fred's death. She kind of thought it was tight-lipped, but apparently not. What the Mackenzies are worried about, though, is June with the help of the American government, might be able to get to their family, i.e. Hannah. Commander McKenzie and his wife start trashing June, saying how she's a monster, how she's a cancer they need to rid themselves of, unknowingly doing so in the presence of her baby daddy, Nick, and Commander Lawrence, who's helped her in the past. Luckily for everybody in attendance, though, the food finally arrives and they eat. As Nick is getting ready to leave, he heads outside and notices that Tuello is standing in a gazebo by himself. So he takes this opportunity to head over there and talk to him. He tells Tuello that he wants to be the one to tell June about Rose. Tuello is completely okay with that. His big concern is, has Nick given any thought to what he proposed? Nick working for the Americans. And Nick just tells him, yeah, man, it's not the right time for that. I, I, I can't. But this conversation is interrupted by Commander McKenzie who finds it really suspicious that Nick is having a conversation with Tuello in the first place. He tells Tuello that he wants to talk to Nick alone and then explains to Nick how far back he goes with Rose's dad. And he would hate to think that Nick's fast rise in the Gilead government had to do with the fact that he married Rose. Nick denies any wrongdoing in this. He doesn't want Mackenzie thinking that he only married Rose for political gain. But as if he didn't have enough pressure on him already... Now he's got Mackenzie, who is definitely on his ass. As Mackenzie and Nick were chatting outside, back inside, Serena sits down with Commander Lawrence. Lawrence looks down and sees Serena's finger, or lack thereof, and mentions how Fred shouldn't have done that. Fred was a weak-minded man. Serena agrees with all of it, and admits that lately she's been thinking maybe it's a blessing that he died and he couldn't be here to raise her baby. The conversation then moves to something that was discussed over dinner. Lawrence mentioned how he doesn't plan on remarrying. And Mackenzie told Lawrence, we need to discuss that at the council meeting tomorrow because a single man has no place in leadership. While it's callous, Serena knows that deep down, Mackenzie's right. An unmarried man in Gilead is going to have limited influence and she knows that Lawrence doesn't want limited influence. He explains that marrying for power doesn't always work out well and Serena says, well, it depends on the marriage. She's definitely hinting at Lawrence marrying her to stay in good favor with the Gilead government. She eventually, though, says her goodbyes and heads back to the hotel where Mark escorts her. Mark gets ready to leave, and she says, no, I need to talk to you. I'm staying in Gilead. Toronto isn't my home. This place is. Mark is really surprised by this. She's finally free, and she wants to go back. He knows it's not going to be safe for her. He reminds her that Gilead is not safe for women, especially if you're not married. But Serena completely disagrees and tells Mark, I don't think being unmarried is going to be my situation for very long. 
There's then a knock at the door, and a guy comes in and tells her that her attendance is requested at the commander meeting the next day. She RSVPs, and the next day, she's going to head to the council meeting, and Mark is going to head back to Toronto. And while all of Gilead is sleeping, the message to Nick finally arrives. He's able to get on the satellite phone and talk to June. June right away asks how Hannah's doing, and she's doing fine. She then asks what the color means, and he tells her it means that she's ready to be married off. Which is horrible, because she's not even close to being age-appropriate for that. When June asks Nick if he can use his influence to kind of look out for her, he says no, because of the fact that he's remarried. He explains who Rose is, and the fact that Rose knows all about June, and that June would even like Rose. But unfortunately, for the time being, he's got to stay put. Right before he hangs up the phone, he explains that they're not going to be able to talk for a long time, and she needs to look out for herself. Commander McKenzie is after her, and he's got power. So stay safe and make sure Nicole's safe. The next day, June heads back to Toronto. And while she's heading back, Serena heads to that council meeting. Right before it starts up, she runs into Commander Lawrence. She asks Lawrence, did you call this council meeting thinking that if he did, it's a sign that he is going to marry her, but he explains, no, I didn't. And that's when Lawrence realizes what's going on. He tells Serena, I really hope you didn't have any expectations of me. And while Serena says no, she absolutely did. And now she's nervous because she's wondering why exactly she was called. Council meeting then starts up and she stands in front of all these commanders and they explain that they don't really know exactly what to do with her. She's the legendary Serena Waterford. You're not going to make her a handmaid. So what they decided to do is make her a quasi-ambassador. After the show that she put on for the world during Fred's funeral, they feel like they can use her as influence to the rest of the world to show what kind of country Gilead really is. So, they're going to send her back to Toronto. She's not happy about this. She wanted to stay in Gilead. She wanted to have some kind of influence on the country that she formed. But she also doesn't really have a choice. As Lawrence puts it, you're a peculiar woman and this country just isn't built for your type. So reluctantly, Serena's going to have to agree. She does tell the council that she needs a staff and she needs a lot of support in this matter, including security to help keep anybody that would get to her or her baby away, i.e. June. They understand and they agree to all of it, but they end up sending her back to Toronto. Her disappointment, though, turns around when she arrives and she sees all the support that she's getting from strangers. She hops in a car, though, heading back to the detention center because right now they really don't have a place for her. But then there's a roadblock can't figure out what's going on and why this car is in the road and not moving. And that's when June Osborne comes out of nowhere, smacks her hand on the glass and says, Never touch my daughter again. She just keeps repeating it until finally the car backs up and gets the hell out of there. But now that she's back in Toronto, Serena knows that June can pretty much get to her when she really wants to. And that might be Serena's biggest fear. In episode four, June heads to her weekly therapy session. She recently had an incident where she was at the park with Nicole and someone came up and recognized her. At first, it seemed a little friendly, but then things just got weird. The woman called June a whore because she's pro-Gilead. She even went so far as to say that June was lucky to be in Gilead, and that's when June kind of snapped. She put her hands on her, threatened her, so that gets brought up in the therapy session. And while June was in this session... Serena was being released. Mark lets her know that the Canadian government isn't going to surveil her 100% of the time. She'll have some semblance of privacy. But he does make a one last ditch plea for her to accept Canada's offer for asylum. As an American citizen, she has that right. But she says, I'm not an American citizen. My allegiance is to God. He then releases her from custody. She's going to be restricted to affiliated Gilead properties... This within accordance of her lack of diplomatic status. She basically has no money, and she's homeless, but she's not without friends. She obviously has the support of some people in Canada, but Gilead has set her up with a driver named Ezra Shaw. She'll be living in some Gilead property that was owned before the war. In an effort to improve relations, Canada unfreeze the property, so Gilead is all but building an embassy. Of course, they're not calling it that. They're calling it a cultural center. It's currently being built, and that's where Serena will live and work and really be the poster child for the pro-Gilead way of life. 
After he releases Serena out to the public, Mark heads over to let June know what's going on. He meets with June, Luke, Moira, but before he can even get any of this out, they want to know all about Hannah. And he tells them that she looked very healthy, but they're pissed off about the fact that he didn't bring Hannah back with him. So already tensions are pretty high when he lets them know that Serena is now released and there's nothing he can do about it. While the women in the room aren't happy about this, it's actually Luke who gets the most upset and he kicks Mark out of the house. Right before he leaves, he tells June she has no money, she has no place to live, she's very limited. But June just shakes her head and says, I warned you about her. She's dangerous, but you won't listen. You're such a disappointment. And he tells her, maybe your expectations were a little unrealistic. Once he leaves, Luke starts talking about how they're going to shut this thing down, all the things they can do. But June is oddly very calm, and that's because she knows she has a weapon buried outside. In the middle of the night, she goes and she digs up that gun, and she drives to the Gilead Embassy. She starts trying to cock it back, but the damn thing has got frozen dirt in it, so she's going to have to clean it beforehand. But she's not willing to just leave and not make her presence felt. She drives up to the front of the building, gets out, and stares up where she sees Serena staring back at her. It freaks Serena out quite a bit, but as Ezra tells her, there's nothing I can do about prohibiting her from driving around. We'll beef up security, but that's about it. Once June gets home, she tells Luke that she drove over there. And all she can think about is shooting Serena in the head, and she can't stop thinking about it. Luke starts trying to calm her down, reminding her that there's no army this time. They literally have a building. And by the way, that building has building codes that probably aren't up to spec. There is a path to shutting them down. But in June's mind, that's not going to be enough. He then reminds her that if she shoots her in the head... It's going to give her instant gratification, but then they'll take Nicole from her. They'll arrest her. They'll lock her up. And by losing Nicole and getting locked up, they lose any chance they had of getting Hannah back. This does end up working a little bit. It calms June down for the time being, and the two head off to bed. Even with the visual of June staring at her from the street level, Serena has a job to do. And the next day, she's trying to get to it, but she's noticing a trend. Some consulates have extended invitations to her, but... Lawrence or somebody else from Gilead is declining them on her behalf. So she calls up Lawrence to find out why that is. Lawrence tells her that she doesn't need to overexert herself. Everybody's already thrilled with her work, but she feels like she's being silenced. She reminds Lawrence that women in South America have only heard the worst of Gilead, and it's important to remind the consulate that their methods are working. They're the only country to see a rise in birth rates. So Lawrence begrudgingly tells her that Venezuela has been open to some of their methods and he'll set up a tea date that she can go and make her pitch at. Lawrence then suggests that Serena stay away from June. He heard about the incident, and while Serena says that she's not that easily intimidated, her face and her tone say otherwise. But she's not going to give in to June quite yet. In fact, she wants to show June that she's not intimidated by her. So she sends her a card in the mail that is addressed to Afred. And it says the Republic of Gilead is pleased to announce the opening of a Gilead Information Center. And that infuriates June. She, along with Luke and Moira, by the way, are worried that with Serena having a lot of support of the world behind her now with that PR stunt of a funeral, she's going to slowly creep the Gilead lifestyle into Canada. And next thing you know... Canada is going to become the new Gilead. June ends up yelling at Luke that the only way to stop her and stop Gilead is to put all of them in the ground. She then has to go tend to Nicole, who is crying, but she's still extremely annoyed. She's sick of Luke telling her to calm down, and she vents to Moira that apparently Luke forgot none of this worked the first time Gilead took over her country. But Moira gives June the truth, which is Luke's right. She reminds June that this is a refugee town and an overcrowded one at that. You've got to play by the rules or you get thrown in jail for just stepping out of line a little bit. And Moira, just like Luke, tells June, Serena is not worth losing your family over. Deep down, June knows that Moira and Luke are right, but she still needs time to calm down. So she just sits in baby Nicole's room for a little bit. And while June is frustrated by the way Luke is handling it, he isn't just sitting on his hands. While June was upstairs venting to Moira, Luke headed out. He went to go meet with Serena. 
Luke pulls out a stack of papers and tells her, these are all building codes. I found 15 violations. I make one call, this place gets shut down. Serena, though, isn't that concerned about the building code situation. She asked Luke, is that really what you came here to tell me? And Luke says, no. I also came here to tell you that my wife is going to kill you. And I'm going to let her. So, you could get kicked out, you could be killed, or you could just help us get Hannah back. But Serena tells him that Hannah, or as she refers to her, Agnes, is happy. And who is she to get in the way of God's will when Agnes has loving parents? She then really hits home with Luke when she asks, You know, I always wondered why you didn't risk your life to come back and save your daughter. I mean, your wife, she was there and she was suffering. Although, I know that she had Nick's support and that probably gave you a little bit of comfort. These comments absolutely crush Luke, but the only thing he does is crumple up some papers in his hand and warn Serena that she stay away from his family or the next time he sees her, he'll kill her himself. Luke then leaves and Serena gets ready to do a photo shoot, but outside there's quite a commotion. You've got pro-Serena people and pro-Gilead, and then you've got protesters. One of those protesters just so happens to be June. She cleaned the gun, and she headed over to the Gilead Embassy with plans on visiting Serena. But when she saw the crowd, she got involved. When one of the pro-Gilead people tells Moira there is no America and then punches her, June pulls out the gun, pointing it at him. And then all of a sudden, he becomes a little bit of a soy boy. I can say that because I am a soy boy. But then June goes off and fires the gun into the air. And the crowd disperses pretty quickly. Inside the building, an already heightened Serena gets pretty scared, and Ezra ushers her outside. As June is trying to flee, she just so happens to run into Luke. And as they both try to flee, they see Serena escaping from the back door. Now's June's chance. She has Serena dead to right. She has a gun, but she doesn't pull it. She just lets Serena go. June and Luke then head home, and Luke gives her a little bit of good news. He's got a friend downtown who's going to shut down the embassy before it can even open because of construction and zoning problems. She tells Luke, I didn't do it this time, but I can't promise that I won't do it next time. And he tells her, well, I can't promise that I won't do it either. They then end up having sex, so that's cool. With a threat against her life, though, Serena has to get to a secure location, and Ezra finds one. He escorts her to her house where a woman comes down and she is absolutely starstruck to be in the presence of Serena Waterford. Her name is Alanis Wheeler. Her husband is Ryan Wheeler. And when she sees Serena, and more importantly, Serena's baby bump, she gets down on her knees and she starts praying. It's weird. Even Serena seems to be a little bit uncomfortable. But back in Gilead, Janine is back on the mend. And by her side, she's got Aunt Lydia although she doesn't want Aunt Liddy anywhere near her. She's kind of fed up with playing the game, she's annoyed at what's going on, and she takes great offense to when Aunt Lydia blames everything on Esther, not seeing maybe why Esther acted out, you know, the whole fact that she was raped at such a young age. Janine doesn't blame Esther at all. She thinks that her actions were actually justified. And Aunt Lydia just feels like Janine lashing out has to do more with June's influence than anybody else. Aunt Lydia feels like she has to do something. So she goes to Commander Lawrence and suggests that they change the Handmaid's situation up. Her proposal is the Handmaids no longer live with their commanders. They live by themselves in one secure location where Aunt Lydia can watch after them. And then once a month, the commanders show up, they do the ceremony, and then they leave. But Commander Lawrence laughs that off. He tells Aunt Lydia, these are pious men. They need to get the rocks off somewhere. The Handmaid's system isn't changing. Not now. Just get a grip on them. But in order to do that, she's going to need somebody on her side. And she feels like the person to be able to do that would be Janine. She apologizes to Janine, saying that she should have listened to her about Esther. But then she says, I need your help. You know these girls. I need you to watch over them and tell me when they're struggling. And Janine says, Aunt Lydia, if I do that, you're going to do something horrible, like poke their eye out or send them to the colony. But Lydia says, no, I won't. I want to do things differently. I want to address problems with more compassion. Janine, though, doesn't say anything. Aunt Lydia then escorts her back into the barracks with the handmaids, where once she leaves, the girls surround Janine to hear about everything she just went through, because Janine, to them, is like a rock star. 
In episode five, Serena wakes up in the Wheeler household the next day, heads downstairs, and she's greeted by Ezra, who showed up to check on her. She asks about the whereabouts for Mr. Wheeler because she still hasn't met him yet, and she wants to thank him for his hospitality and whatnot. But Ezra tells her that he's really busy. He'll try to set up a meeting with him, but his schedule's just pretty booked at the moment. She then heads into the dining room where Alanis has set up a feast for breakfast. After the thank yous get out of the way, Serena tells her, we'll have that center back up and running in no time. Serena's not ready to let a few rules get in the way of, quote, God's will. Other than that, Serena doesn't do a damn thing that day. Well, the next day, Alanis has set up a little bit of a brunch with other women of like mind. And they, just like Alanis, are completely starstruck around Serena. They start showing their support, telling her about themselves. But when the baby kicks, they all get around her and start touching her stomach. She can't help but think back to when Gilead first started. The handmaids weren't even a thing. It was just adopting children from, quote, unfit parents. Back then, the wives and the commanders, they were still trying the natural way. And to see where she is now, it's quite a jump. She does have to step away because Alanis tells her that she has a call. It's from Gilead. But when Alanis steps out of the room, Serena tells her that she can be on the call and that Gilead would probably love to hear from her. And that is something that Alanis just laughs off, telling Serena wives shouldn't burden themselves with business things. She then hops on the call, and it's a little bit surprising because it's not just Commander Lawrence. It's also Commander Putnam as well. The topic of conversation is what happened at the center. Commander Putnam especially is annoyed at how the whole thing played out. This has already been very expensive for Gilead, and now they've just got an empty building and bad press. Serena explains that she can't be responsible for the actions of refugees and heaps all of the blame on June. It's Commander Lawrence who gets the topic back on track by saying, all of that aside, we're still planning on opening up the center again. But Serena has had some ideas on that, and she thinks that focusing on Gilead is a mistake. Lawrence especially is a little bit confused because it's the Gilead Information Center. It should probably have to do with Gilead. But Serena says, I think we should focus on fertility and conception. It's all about the babies. That's all people want to hear about. The Gilead Information Center, that's always going to be a magnet for attack. But a fertility center, all about children, it's hard to be against that. Lawrence tells her it's an interesting idea. He seems open to it, but Commander Putnam seems absolutely close-minded and hangs up on Serena, just telling her, we'll take it into account. Once they get off the phone, Putnam chalks up his behavior to keeping Serena in line. But it turns out Serena wasn't the only person who had grand ideas. Lawrence did as well. He's got this idea called New Bethlehem, where they basically just welcome back everybody, opening up the borders. But Commander Putnam hates it. He looks at it like you're welcoming back traitors and criminals and rapists and terrorists. And he tells Lawrence that the other commanders are never going to support this. But Lawrence gets blunt with them and tells them that if they keep the borders up and the country closed, the country will die. And everything they've worked for would have been for nothing. Putnam, however, in a very smug tone, says, yeah, that speech isn't going to work. And he walks out. With the rest of her day in front of her, though, Serena heads outside And she sees that she's getting a lot of flowers from well-wishers. Ezra is there kind of managing everything. And when Serena asks about going up and talking to one particular woman, Ezra tells her, you can't. We don't know who she is and we don't know what she wants. So why don't you just go enjoy the grounds? To somebody who didn't know the full story, you might think Serena was a prisoner. But when she gets back in the house, she finally gets that one-on-one with Mr. Wheeler. He apologized for being so busy and not being able to meet with her. But then he tells her that he talked to the commanders about her proposal, and they're going to move forward with it. He even calls it a real stroke of genius. She starts talking about going back to the center, settling in, starting work, but Wheeler tells her that's not necessary. She'll have input, of course, but she's also very pregnant, and most pregnancies require bed rest. As he's leaving, she asks him to get her a cell phone so she could at least conduct some business, but he tells her there's too many security concerns to do that. So for the time being, she is pregnant and stuck in this house and can't leave. All she has to do is grab a red cloak and a white bonnet. But with her former handmaid, June gets woken up in the middle of the night by a phone call, and it's from Lily. A guardian is coming across the border with information on wife school, so 
her, Luke, and Moira get in the car, and they drive to go meet with Lily and hopefully the Guardian. On the way to the woods, though, they do encounter some anti-refugee protesters. There's a lot of people in Canada that don't want them there. But once they get to Lily, they find out that they made that trip for nothing. She explains that the Guardian is stuck in no man's land. They've really beefed up security on the border, and it's just not safe for him to cross at the moment. He put up the signal that he was stuck and wasn't coming, and unfortunately for June and Luke and Moira, they'd already left at that point. It's so bad that Lily's going to have to move her outpost to somewhere else. But Luke isn't willing to let this be a waste of time. He tells them, I'm going to go over. Everything we want to know about Hannah is just over there. So I'm going to go get it. And while it's not safe at all, June decides to go with them. So Lily draws them a map on where to meet with this guardian and lets the guardian know that the couple are on their way. They then head off, cross the border, and now they're back in Gilead. It takes them a while. They start at dusk and they walk through the night. June starts getting flashbacks of when they fled the first time. And as they're walking to meet with the Guardian, Lily and Moira just sit in the cabin getting drunk, waiting for their return. Eventually, though, the next day, they do end up getting to the rendezvous point, meeting up with the Guardian, giving him the code word, but it's pretty clear he is spooked. He tells the group that it's not safe where they currently are and they have to follow him. First, Luke and June have absolutely no interest in doing that. They just want to get the information and get back. But he tells them, I'm leaving. So you can either follow me and get that information, or you could just head back to where you came without it. They, of course, follow him. And he leads them to an empty bowling alley that he really uses as a hangout. They're pretty surprised because it's got electricity, it's got a bathroom. Hell, it's even got beer. I mean, this Guardian is a very accommodating host. He gives them the information they came for, telling them that Hannah, or what she's referred to now as a plum, is in a wife's school, where they're basically just taught to be wives. And this school goes by pretty quickly. They want to get them in, teach them, and then get them matched up to be a wife. The fact that they saw her on TV still wearing plum purple is a sign that she hasn't been matched up yet. Both Luke and June are completely disgusted because Hannah is 12 years old. But the good thing is that these wives' schools are for the best of the best, and the girls are at least treated well. The Guardian then explains that everything about the wives' school is kept under lock and key. It's pretty covert, pretty secret. And then he hands over a flash drive, telling them that everything they have on the wives' schools are on the flash drive. Luke and June are really appreciative. They thank him. They turn to leave, and he says, where are you going? You can't leave now. You'll get caught. It's crazy to leave during the day. You might as well just sit here, lay low for a bit, and then we'll leave at night. I can guide you back. And while June really wants to get back home, everything the guy said made a lot of sense. So they decide to stay. And they end up really liking him. At one point, June tells Luke he's unlike anybody I've ever met in Gilead. He's so pure. So he's a very unique guy. Luke actually likes him so much that he does the one thing he's not supposed to do, exchange names. And the name of the Guardian is Jaden. But eventually, it comes time to leave, and they head out. And Jaden knew a way quicker path, but it was also a more dangerous path, because he ends up stepping on a landmine, and it goes off. It doesn't kill him right away, he's still alive, and June and Luke go and tend to him, but he warns them, you gotta get out of here, it's good to draw attention, and sure enough, it does. They're not too far from the border, and they take off running. But that explosion drew a lot of attention, and they end up getting caught and separated. In episode 6, Serena wakes up and she gets ready for a doctor's appointment. She's going to have a sonogram, but she's surprised when the doctor arrives at the front door. He tells her that they are indeed having that doctor's appointment, but it's going to be at the house. They travel up the steps, and sure enough, the wheelers have set up a practice in their house for Serena, so she doesn't have to leave. And Serena was kind of looking forward to getting off the property, but now she doesn't have to. After the sonogram, which, by the way, the baby looks healthy, all that good stuff, Serena needs to lower her blood pressure, but nothing out of the ordinary. The doctor, Dr. Landers, asks Serena to dinner. He tells her that the wheelers convinced him to do it. He doesn't want to come off as a creep, but he, quote, admires her. Serena doesn't give an answer, but she's definitely a little creeped out. 
Later on in the day, Serena sees Alanis, and she gingerly brings up Dr. Landers, putting a feeler out there just to see what Alanis says. And Alanis starts talking him up, pointing out what a catch he is. So it's obvious that Alanis was behind most of this. And that's when Serena says that she doesn't really have any interest in dating her gynecologist. To be quite honest, she doesn't know if she wants to remarry at all. And Alanis thinks that that's a horrible idea and flat out tells her, this baby cannot grow up without a father. You can't be a single mother. And Serena says, I'm not. I'm a widow. Serena gets so annoyed that she says, you know what, I'm going to go for a walk. But Alanis stops her, telling her, it's too cold. You can't do that. And the two women get into it about what Serena can and cannot do. But Alanis puts her foot down, saying, Serena, get back to your room. And suddenly, Serena doesn't really feel like she has any control whatsoever what happens to her or the baby. She is very uncomfortable. She actually goes upstairs and she cries. Later that night, though, she gets called to meet with Mr. Wheeler. She figures it has to do with what her and Alanis talked about, but Ryan says, no, I heard about that, but I I figure you guys will just figure it out on your own. No, what I wanted to tell you is they caught June Osborne in no man's land. Serena's a little shell-shocked and asks Ryan what's going to happen to her, and he tells her that he's going to send Ezra to meet up with June and he's going to take care of her, meaning he's going to kill her. He doesn't trust that the Gilead police or the eyes are going to deal with her, quote, properly. Serena says to Ryan, I want to go. And at first, Ryan pushes back, but Serena keeps making the case that she wants to be there. She wants to see June die and reassure her child once he comes into the earth that the person who killed his father is no longer here. This impassioned plea ends up working, and Ryan agrees to it, telling her that she can go with Ezra the next day, but if there are any issues, she's got to turn back around and head home. And she is very relieved. Now, over with June and Luke, they're scooped up, put in the back of a van, and transported to what seems to be a Gilead black site. Their photographs are taken. And as June is getting photographed, she asks, what is this? We're still in no man's land. Luke pipes up and says, we're refugees. We have asylum in Canada. But the mercenaries don't care. They lock them up and they let them sit. And Luke doesn't handle it well at all. For June, she's been through this before. But Luke starts thinking of ways to get out, talking too much. Eventually, June has to tell him to shut up. A little while later, the mercenaries come back to take June's fingerprints and verify who she is. And June asks, are you taking us back to Gilead? And they confirm, yeah, we are. So she tells them, tell your boss to call Commander Lawrence or Commander Blaine. But they're not taking orders from her. And they just push her back into the cage and lock it up. They then go to take fingerprints from Luke, but he tries to escape. And he ends up getting his ass beat pretty good. The next day, Luke mentions how the last time, they didn't get to say goodbye. And he doesn't want that to happen again. And June says, well, it's not going to happen because we're going to stay alive. He says, June, when we get back to Gilead, they're going to execute us. And she tells him that when they were separated before, she never gave up hope. So don't start now. But when it comes time to go back to Gilead, the two are separated. For real this time. They say that Luke has asylum in Canada, so they're just going to drop him off at the border. But June is heading back to Gilead, and she's distraught. Not about the idea of heading back, but more so the idea of doing it without Luke after she gave that speech about how they weren't going to leave each other. But there's nothing she can do. On the journey, though, her transport stops. Ezra gets on, and he tells the guards that Commander Wheeler has requested June Osborne. So they let June go with Ezra. They're in the middle of nowhere, and it's just Ezra, Serena, and the car. And when June sees Serena, she starts rolling her eyes like, you've got to be kidding me. The two women exchange some words. They're not pleasant. And then it gets time for June to get on her knees and die. Ezra pulls the gun out and he's about to shoot June in the head. But Serena stops him saying, you know what? I want to do it. Before she pulls the trigger, though, she makes June pray. And June says a prayer for their children, both Serena's and June's. When the prayer is over, though, Serena does not pull the trigger at June She turns the gun on Ezra and shoots him in the shoulder. He was wearing a bulletproof vest, so he's not dead, but he's definitely hurt and injured. And then, at gunpoint, Serena commands June to get in the car and drive. And a very confused June Osborne heads off with Serena Joy in the back seat. Now, not too far away, in Gilead, Aunt Lydia goes to check on Esther, and she is shocked because it turns out Esther is pregnant. She hasn't been promised to any home. Which means she was having sex with somebody. And Lydia starts doing the math and she realizes that 
she must have had sex near Commander Waterford's funeral. And the only person that really makes sense for any of this would be Commander Putnam, because that's when Esther first met Putnam, and they were alone. So Aunt Lydia goes and has a conversation with a very upset Esther. She starts asking Esther how this happened, but Esther, understandably so, doesn't really want to give Aunt Lydia any information. She feels like it'll be used against her. But Aunt Lydia assures her it won't. And it takes a little bit more time, but Esther tells Aunt Lydia that Commander Putnam raped her. And she did nothing to give any indication that she was into it, but she was raped. And that's why she's pregnant. Aunt Lydia feels terrible. She starts apologizing to Esther for putting her in that position. But Esther says, no, you're not. They all do it. You know they do. You're not sorry. Esther then starts screaming at Aunt Lydia and forcing her to leave. Right after visiting with Esther, Aunt Lydia heads on over to Commander Lawrence's place to report Commander Putnam. But she's pretty disgusted because Commander Lawrence acts like it's no big deal that Esther was raped. In fact, he kind of looks at it like, we got the end result we wanted, a pregnant girl. Aunt Lydia can't believe that Lawrence is defending a rapist. But Commander Lawrence just excuses her, telling her, you've given me a lot to think about. Later that night, Lawrence, Nick, and Putnam all meet up together. They let Putnam know that Esther is pregnant, and they actually toast to it, joking that Putnam is going to single-handedly repopulate the entire country. Lawrence then says, to think that such an impulsive and quick act could have such big political implications. And Putnam knows what he's talking about. So he tells Lawrence, your plans for New Bethlehem, they're dead. I know you don't see it yet, but it's just what's best for Gilead. And Lawrence says, you know, this is actually a really good teaching moment for Commander Blaine over here. Except when you've been outplayed. But it turns out that Lawrence was actually mocking Putnam. Because Putnam is the one who's been outplayed. The Putnams go out for dinner and everybody's staring at them. Because they know what Commander Putnam did. The word's gotten out. Commander Putnam, though, isn't really phased by it until the eyes come for him. They tell him that he's been arrested. And then they bring him in front of Lawrence and Nick. Nick tells him that the High Criminal Court of Gilead, in a special overnight session, found him guilty. It was for the rape of unassigned property. Putnam starts making his case that Esther was his handmaid. She belongs to him. But technically, the rape happened the day before she was assigned. So because of this, he is guilty. Nick then pulls out a gun and shoots him in the head. When Nick gets home, his wife is pretty upset. She knows what Nick just did, and he tells her, you shouldn't be worrying about that kind of stuff. But Rose says to him, I'm just worried about the kind of person this makes you. And he says... I'm the kind of person that will make Gilead a safer place for our child. But Rose questions if he really did it for their baby or somebody else. Commander Putnam's body is then put on the wall, and Aunt Lydia brings all the handmaids around it and shows them, telling them that in Gilead there are consequences for disobeying God no matter who you are or how powerful you are. In Episode 7, at gunpoint, June continues to drive, but she's asking Serena a bunch of questions like, where are we going? What are those guys going to do to Luke? And the issue is Serena is going into labor. June, who is getting visibly frustrated, eventually just says, you know what, screw this. She gets out of the car, leaving Serena to drive herself. But Serena doesn't get too far down the road before she crashes the car and guilt gets to June's. She goes to check on her and realizes, oh, of course, you're going into labor. Why wouldn't you go into labor at this time? While she hates Serena... The mother in her cannot just abandon her, so she gets her to the closest empty place, which is a barn. Being a first-time mother, Serena doesn't really know what to expect. It's not ideal conditions to have a child in. It's an abandoned barn, and it's pretty cold outside. Still, it's better conditions than when June gave birth to Nicole, but for Serena, who's never done this, she's pretty scared. And that's when June starts telling her about Hannah's birth, which was 19 hours, and then Obviously, the birth of Nicole, which she did by herself. At least now, Serena has somebody there with her. But as the two women discuss this, the contractions are getting worse and worse. June, who seems to kind of know what she's doing, steps in as a quasi-doctor. Checking the cervix, making sure she can feel the head. She's going to have to be the one to deliver this baby. But as she's trying to do so, Serena assumes that June is just going to harm her child. You can't really blame her because... June has kind of given off that I'm going to kill you vibe this entire time up until this point. So June, who is just really trying to help, says, screw this. If you want to do it on your own, go ahead. 
and June walks outside to the car. The car is stuck in a ditch, so June has to jerry-rig it out of there, but ultimately she's able to. And right as she's about to leave, she notices that there's a bunch of blood on her hands, and it's not hers, it's Serena's, and guilt once again gets to her, so she gets out of the car and goes back into that barn. When June walks in, Serena can't believe that she returned, and she's not scared, she's actually grateful. The two women then start going to work on breathing exercises, pushing, and trying to get this baby out. And after three hard minutes of pushing with some dramatic music, the baby finally comes out. Baby Noah. Everything appears good with him. He appears healthy. The only issue is he's a baby in a barn right now. As Serena feeds Noah for the first time, June starts telling Serena about the issues that she had when she tried to feed Hannah. How she would blame herself when in reality it wasn't her fault at all. It's just biology at times. Issues arise, but... Those things happen, and you just move on. If you wouldn't know the backstory, you'd actually think these two women were friends because they've been getting along. And that's when Serena asked June, why didn't you kill me? I'm not talking about right now. I'm talking about back at the center when you had your chance. Why didn't you kill me? And an emotional June says, I didn't want to. The conversation then moves to Fred, how every time Serena thought about having a baby, she envisioned Fred there, and now he's not. But she turns to June and says, do you think he's going to be like him? And June says, well, that depends on how he's raised. June then lets Serena rest with the baby. And when she comes back, Serena didn't get much rest. She was worried she was going to smother the child. And that's when June says, Serena, we got to get you out of here. You can't just stay in a barn. We got to get you to a hospital. But Serena doesn't want to. She doesn't want to go to a hospital because she's worried that the wheelers will find her. And that's when Serena tells June all about the wheelers how they basically treat her like their handmaid. She realizes how horrible that sounds, but she also realizes how messed up that system is. And she's worried that if the wheelers find her, they're going to take Noah from her. Because of her experience, Serena is now coming full circle, and she realizes how horrible she was. She doesn't want the wheelers to get Noah so badly that she tells June to take him take him back to Canada, and raise him with Luke. She'd rather Noah be raised with Luke, who she calls a good man, than the Wheelers. In Serena's mind, she doesn't really have a lot of options. She can't go back to Gilead, and if she goes back to Canada, they're going to find her, so she's willing to give her baby up to her mortal enemy just so this child doesn't fall in the hands of Ryan and Alanis. She looks at her child and says, I delivered him and I held him and maybe that's all that's meant for me in this life. Maybe it's God's will. But June does not believe in God's will. She starts giving Serena a speech about how they thought handmaids were God's will, but they weren't. The women of Gilead didn't care that these were real people. They just thought that they were vessels. And as Serena starts apologizing for her behavior in the past, June cuts her off and says, I don't care that you're sorry. We mattered. We were people. We had lives. And that's why I'm going to save yours, Serena. Because this isn't Gilead. And I am not you. This isn't for you, by the way. It's for him. You're his mother. And he belongs with you. The two women then get back in the car, drive over the border, and find the closest hospital. Serena gets admitted... And they take her back, and June promises, I will be here. I'll wait for you. But then she makes a phone call to Luke to let her know that she's safe and where she is. Shortly after Serena is admitted, June goes to check on her, and she gives her an update on everything with Noah. While Serena is really concerned about things like jaundice and the fact that he was taken to the NICU and the fact that they're feeding him with formula, it's June who calms her down by letting her know all of that is normal. Your baby is healthy. You are fine. Everything's okay. As June gets up to leave, Serena extends her hand and says, June, thank you. And the two women hold hands as June, who doesn't really know what to say, just says, you're welcome. When June leaves Serena's room, there is Luke waiting for her. And the two embrace. June fills Luke in on everything that's happened. But then all of a sudden, two cops and an immigration officer walk by and June gets concerned. Luke tells her not to worry about it, but at this point, June's invested and she can't. 
She follows the immigration officer and the two cops into Serena's room where they arrest her. Serena and Luke are watching all of this go down. The police inform Serena that as an undocumented person, she doesn't even have a right to a lawyer. They handcuff her to the bed and they explain that once she's discharged, she's going to go to a detention facility. And the detention facility does not have infant care which means that her child is going to go into a foster system. June, who is just about as shell-shocked as Serena, can't figure out how this is happening, and that's when Luke tells her that it was he who called. Serena gave up her diplomatic status when she left that information center. Her crossing over the border, crossing over again, it led to this. And as Serena is screaming not to take away her baby, there's June, who seems powerless to do anything about it, And who didn't want this to happen. Because at that moment, June knows exactly what Serena's going through. In episode 8, Serena's worst nightmares have come true. Alanis and Ryan have taken her baby and she's stuck in a detention center. She does get to see Alanis because Alanis comes by to grab the milk. But she makes it clear to Serena that she is no fit right now to be a mother. Even though Serena feels like she is. Alanis is pissed off, as is Serena... But Serena doesn't really have a choice but to play nice because she knows that Alanis can harm her child. And she doesn't want anything to happen to Noah. So she kind of just has to bite her tongue. She's also been blowing up June's phone, but June hasn't answered. She's dealing with other issues. On top of that, her and the rest of the refugees are no longer being welcomed in. There's a big anti-refugee contingent in Canada, and they're getting louder and louder, and it's tougher to ignore. It's so bad that Luke actually thinks about getting out, going anywhere but there. Hawaii, Alaska, Europe. But as Luke is discussing the possibility, June gets a phone call from Commander Lawrence. With Putnam out of the way, Lawrence went into the phase of New Bethlehem, pitching it to the other commanders. There is some initial pushback from some of the commanders on letting refugees in. They still look at people that got out as heathens. And even more so, they worry that people currently in Gilead will want to get into New Bethlehem. But Lawrence states that it shouldn't be an issue. The people that want to leave Gilead had pretty much already left or tried to leave, and they know who they are. This will allow refugees to see loved ones again. On top of it, when they do get this pushback from one particular commander, they hint that that's what Putnam thought. And after what happened to Putnam, it changes this commander's tune pretty quickly. So with, for the time being... Most of the commanders on board with New Bethlehem, Lawrence heads to Toronto to start talking to families about coming back. The first person he called was June Osborne. He starts off by telling her that the America she knew is dead. Everything she clinged to is just simply no more. All of the greed that you saw in America almost ended the human race, but Gilead fixed it. They're having babies again. Lawrence does admit that he had to get a bunch of religious whack jobs to get that message across, and it did work, but now that it's working, it's time to pull back on that a bit. They do that with New Bethlehem, allowing the refugees to come back. He tells her all about New Bethlehem, that there's no handmaids, you can read books, but more importantly, she can be reunited with Hannah. He knows this is a lot for her to take in, so he hands her a cell phone to call him to give him her answer. June gets home and fills Luke in on Lawrence's proposal, and June is considering it, but Luke is totally against it. He doesn't want to go back to Gilead, and he certainly doesn't trust Lawrence. He doesn't know Lawrence the way that June knows Lawrence. June looks at Lawrence like a friend who can protect her. Luke looks at Lawrence like a commander for Gilead. And what Luke can't understand is why didn't June turn him down right then and there, and she yells, because he said Hannah. We can see Hannah again. This starts a pretty big fight between the two, and it gets really nasty. Things are said by June that immediately she regrets. But neither likes the other's approach. June can't stand Luke's attitude. She feels like he's not doing much about it. And Luke can't stand June's because he feels like she's being too reactive. And in the end, absolutely nothing gets accomplished. Now, while these two were arguing, Lawrence paid a visit to Serena in the detention center. The good news is he's gotten the Canadian government to release Serena into Gilead custody. The bad news is her only real option is to go back and live with Ryan and Alanis. She is completely against going back and Lawrence has to remind her they have Noah. And going back and living with them is the only way you're going to ever see your child. She yells at Lawrence, I'm not going to go live with my child's kidnappers. I'm not going to go be a handmaid. 
The next day, back over with her former handmaid, June, she wakes up and she's surprised to walk in the living room because there's Mark Tuello and Luke having a chat. Mark stopped by because he knows about Lawrence's proposal. He also knows that if June goes back, that's going to be a real bad look for America. He looks at what Lawrence is doing as putting the final death nail in America. And June is a pretty powerful symbol. Her returning is a lot of points in Gilead's favor. June shoots back that she doesn't really care about any of that. She just cares about being with her daughter. And Tuello asks, don't you think you owe your country anything? And June reminds him that they got captured getting information. She then asks him, have you done anything with that information? And he tells her, yes, we are doing something, but it's classified. Although June persists and makes him tell her what exactly they're doing, and he admits that they're launching a military action. He can't say any more details about what they're doing, but just that they are doing something. That's not good enough for June, and she asks about the wife schools, but Tuello says, no, we still haven't found Hannah. And June screams at him, well, Lawrence is offering Hannah, and you came all this way to offer nothing. But a frustrated Tuello says, I'm sorry, I can't tell you anything else. I'm just asking you to trust us, please. June is pretty conflicted on what to do, so she goes and has a chat with Serena the next day in the detention center. Serena tells her that Lawrence has been planning this for years, and now it feels like he has the power to actually get it done. So it is a reality, New Bethlehem. Serena, though, gets the conversation off of New Bethlehem into her situation. She needs help in finding an advocate, somebody they can vouch for in Canada so she can get Noah back. June, however, looks at her and says, Serena, we're, we're not friends. And Serena kind of thought they were because June, quote, forgave her. But June tells her, I will never forgive you for what you did. I helped you because your baby is innocent in all of this. Serena starts trying to pitch June on the fact that they had this, quote, bond. But June shoots that down pretty quickly. Serena asks her, what am I supposed to do now? And June's advice is to go live with Ryan, live with Alanis, play the good soldier, but behind closed doors, plan their demise. That's exactly how June survived Gilead, and she uses Fred as an example of that. Her last bit of advice to Serena is, you cannot help your child if you're not with him. And Serena decides to go back. Hat in hand, she goes back to the Wheelers, apologizing for everything that happened. And they make it clear to her that they are bringing her back, but really just so she can breastfeed. That's it. The other motherly duties will be handled by Alanis. Serena agrees to everything, and then she finally gets to see Noah for the first time since he was taken from her in the hospital. She's thrilled to hold him in her hands. She cries. In that moment, she's actually happy. But June is pissed off, and that night she goes and meets with Lawrence. She asks him, if I do what you want me to do, can you stop then from marrying Hannah off? But Lawrence says, Gilead is good at Gilead. I mean, you'd be with her, wouldn't that be enough? But June says no, she would be being raped. And Lawrence tries to pitch it as an arranged marriage, but there's no way to really pitch that that makes it sound good, and it infuriates June even more. She starts yelling at Lawrence, reminding him that he created this world. And a very upset Lawrence says, you don't think I know that? You don't think I know the pain that was caused? I was trying to save the world, and you know what? I actually did it. But somehow it, it, it got away from me. It went septic. You think I wouldn't take it back? I would take it all back. I let the whole human race die, so I wouldn't have to have this on my conscience. That is what New Bethlehem is. It's me trying to fix this. It's where we wrestle a better future out of an unchangeable past. We start in New Bethlehem, and with those reforms and success, five years down the line, ten years down the line, all of Gilead could be like that. A place that doesn't have child brides, a place that doesn't trample on human rights, a place that will actually let you leave. He then looks at her and says, June, I need you. Come help me fix it. She asks him, do you really believe that you can fix it? And Lawrence's response is, I don't have a choice. June doesn't give him a response, but when Lawrence gets back to Gilead, the first place he goes to New Bethlehem, he meets with Nick, who he's been grooming as an ally, and he gives Nick an update on June. He tells her that if he's a betting man, he'd figure that June will be there with Nicole in one to two years. And the idea of having Nicole back in Gilead, back where he can see her, is an enticing one to Nick. But Lawrence is unaware that that night, June got a package from somebody. In the package was a disc that contained a video of Hannah at the bride school. It's brief, it's quick, but it's proof that she hasn't been married off yet. June and Luke start once again arguing about what they're going to do. 
June has decided that she does want to go back. She wants to be with Hannah. She wants to make sure that she's safe. But Luke has no interest in ever going back to Gilead. He'd rather trust Tuello and the American government. He also can't understand why he and Nicole will never be enough for June. And that's when she breaks down and says, because I was never supposed to leave. I was never supposed to leave Hannah behind, and I did. And I have to go back. I have to protect her. June is getting more and more upset, and Luke just gives her a hug. He also gives that video that they got to Tuello, figuring to continue to ride with the American government and see if they can find anything and get Hannah back. Unfortunately, they still don't hear back, and June isn't willing to just sit by the phone and wait. She decides to go to the market and grab some apples. But while she's there, she gets a phone call from Tuello. He tells her that he can't really give her any information, but they found Hannah. With the information provided, they found the wife school, and they're going to get her. June is beside herself with joy. She runs home. She tells Luke and Moira, and they celebrate the fact that Hannah is finally coming home. In episode 9, Luke and June go meet with Mark, and he gives them the update. They found Hannah. She's in a wife school in Colorado Springs. It's an old Air Force base that's been turned into a school, and she's doing fine. But that night, they're going in. Their intel has suggested they have a small window to fly under Gilead's radar and pick up 30 girls that were stolen from their parents, Hannah being one of them. And so far, Hannah's fine. She still goes by Agnes, but she also remembers her real name, Hannah. She even writes it on a couple of pieces of paper. So she's very aware of the fact that she was stolen from Luke and June. What she's unaware of is that night she's going to be taken back to Canada. Luke and June are able to meet the commander that is in charge. He's very aware of their situation. And when June tries to explain that the girls are going to be scared, he says, no, I fully understand. I have a daughter of my own, and my goal is to bring your daughter back and get back to my daughter here in Toronto. The conversation with Mark and the conversation with the soldier give June and Luke a lot of faith. But when Mark tells him that he'll be watching the mission from the consulate that night, June is insistent that she watch along. Mark kind of pushes back, but June tells him, well, not everybody gave the intel that got you to this point. And Mark has to admit that she's right. So that night, Luke and June head to the consulate to watch the mission live, seeing the progress. And everything's going normal until all of a sudden it doesn't. All three planes on the radar just disappear. Luke and June are ushered out of the room. And a little while later, Mark comes up and tells them that everybody's dead. All the girls are alive, but that's because the planes never reached the girls. Gilead had gotten word of their mission and moved their anti-aircraft missiles Over to the border, so as soon as the planes flew over, they got shot down right away. Mark looks visibly shook, and he now has to go tell all the other parents that their children are not coming home, because the mission failed. Now that same day, over in Gilead, the guy running things, Lawrence, has had quite a busy day. It started off with a meeting of Mrs. Putnam and Aunt Lydia. Like any single woman in Gilead, Mrs. Putnam's a little concerned that she's going to be sent to the colonies, but... Aunt Lydia and Commander Lawrence assure that that won't be the case. The reason she was brought there is because Commander Lawrence wants to propose. He tells her that her and the baby can move in and live in the house. It's an arrangement that kind of works for both sides. Lawrence has been getting a lot of crap for not remarrying, and Mrs. Putnam is now a single mother in Gilead. Wasn't exactly what Naomi Putnam had in mind. She doesn't really want to shack up with the guy who was in charge of murdering her husband, even though her husband totally deserved it. But Lawrence tells her just, it's a suggestion, think about it. The next day, he makes a phone call to June. He knew all about the American mission. In fact, he was the one that was in charge of putting the anti-aircraft missiles where they were. So he calls June to revisit his offer. June, however, is livid because Lawrence knows about her situation. Lawrence knows that the girls that the Americans were after were girls that were stolen from their families, like Hannah. Yet, he still thwarted the mission and didn't allow it. June really thought Lawrence was different, but the way that Lawrence was looking at it, he was protecting his country. So his offer for New Bethlehem still stands. He's not doing it out of the goodness of his heart. He's doing it because June Osborne is a symbol. He tells her that if she wants to come to New Bethlehem, she's going to have to go public, saying that the American mission was a failure and it was stupid. And June is not going to do that. She's not going to make Gilead look like the victim. When she calls Gilead an evil country, Lawrence reminds her that he's trying to fix that. He even dangles Nick out there, saying that they can live together, they can borrow sugar from one another if they want to, because he's heading to New Bethlehem. But June is too pissed off. She even goes so far as to say how much Lawrence's wife hated him. 
hated what he did to the country, hated that he was the architect of Gilead. Comments that really do hurt Lawrence. In the end, he tells her that the idea of him just giving up Hannah to go to Canada and live with June and Luke is never going to happen. The offer is, she come back to Gilead and see her daughter, or she never sees her daughter at all. June slams the phone and starts going into a rage. When she finally calms down, she goes and meets with Mark, who admits that they shouldn't have trusted the sources they did. And June's comment to that is, Gilead's always been one step ahead. But after the conversation that she had earlier in the day with Lawrence, she's done with Lawrence. There's no wavering on if she'll go to New Bethlehem or not. She is full-blown American support now. And when she asks Mark, all right, what's next? His idea is Nick. He tells her how he approached Nick when he was in Gilead about switching sides. And he wasn't open to the idea then, but maybe a conversation with June could sway him. He also tells her that the look of a guy like Nick defecting from Gilead would make a big impact. But June can make a big impact as well. After everything she's done, if she just stepped up, she could really put her power to use. But June tells him, I just don't feel comfortable doing that right now. She does, however, tell Mark, set up a meeting. And the next day, June heads and meets with Nick in an undisclosed location. And she starts screaming at him because he didn't take Mark up on his offer. She then starts pitching Nick on the idea of defecting. Coming over, being with her, being with Nicole. But Nick tells her, no, I can't. I have a wife now. I have Rose. Gilead's her home. Her father's high up. She's not going to want to come with. June then starts bringing up what he plans on doing when they put a handmaid in the house, and Nick tells her, Rose is pregnant. June then realizes this whole conversation is futile. He kind of gives June the same speech that Lawrence gave her, how Gilead's changing and they're making it better. In the end, though, they have to say their goodbyes. They both know that it's going to be really hard for them to see one another again. They tell each other that they love each other, and then they go their separate ways. June then heads back to Toronto, where that night there is a candlelight vigil for all of the soldiers who died in the extraction mission. As Mark reads off the names, he's kind of being drowned out by a lot of protesters. Even with people screaming at them to, quote, go home, most of the refugees are simply drowning it out. Eventually, the daughter of the one commander, the guy that was leading the mission, the guy that Luke and June met, she steps up. She can't be any older than five. And she starts doing the Pledge of Allegiance, but she forgets the words. So June decides to step up and help her. And they get through the entire Pledge of Allegiance, and then gunshots ring out. June instinctively hops on top of the girl to protect her, as most people just run for their lives. Then maybe this gunman was sent by someone from Gilead. Because after Nick left June, he headed back to Gilead, and he had a meeting that night with the commanders. While he was meeting with the commanders, Rose was meeting with the other wives, and they were all fawning over the fact that she's pregnant. But in the next room, the commanders discuss what's next for Gilead. They revel in their victory, the fact that the Americans lost in their extraction mission, and they talk about how they've gained even more support from other countries. But then one of the commanders mentions how June is still stirring up trouble, and it's about time they, quote, take care of her. Lawrence just stops dead in his tracks and says, well, it's certainly worth considering. He doesn't really want to show them his hand. All the commanders then walk out of the room, and they congratulate Lawrence because Mrs. Putnam has decided to take him up on his offer, and the two are going to be married. A marriage that will most certainly be an absolute sham. Over with Naomi's former friend, Serena, she's not doing well. Her relationship with Alanis is rough, to say the least. Alanis scheduled a photo shoot with Serena and Noah, and this is all for the new fertility center which is set to open in a couple of days. Serena even asks Alanis if she can go and be there with Noah, but Alanis shoots it down right away, telling Serena that nobody cares that she's going to be there. It's all about Noah. Noah's a star attraction. Serena tries to stick up for herself by reminding Alanis that the commander sent her there to kind of be a figurehead, but Alanis tells her, my husband doesn't answer to those commanders. She then starts telling Serena that she needs to start pumping more so that they can bottle feed Noah. And Serena points out that it won't be that confusing if she just nurses Noah. But Alanis says, my smart boy won't be confused. And that really pisses off Serena. She almost says something to Alanis. She gets close, but she doesn't. She holds her tongue. The fact, though, that this woman is taking credit for her baby really annoys her. With Alanis, though, shooting down the idea of Serena heading to the fertility center for the opening, 
Serena decides a different approach. She goes and talks to Ryan. She makes her pitch. It's one that Ryan is open to, and eventually he actually agrees to it. The next day, the center is set to open, and Serena gets ready to go, and Alanis is furious. She yells at Serena for going behind her back after she said no and convincing Ryan to let her go ahead. She even goes so far as to slap the shit out of Serena. She asks Serena, who the hell do you think you are? And when Serena says, I'm Mrs. Frederick Waterford, Alanis says, no. To me, you are just a whore. She then tells Serena to get in the car, and the two women head off to the center, where they have to play nice. They're in front of a bunch of donors, a bunch of people, and they're in front of Ryan, who likely had no idea about the interaction. Serena is great. She's holding court with Noah, but eventually Alanis pulls her aside and tells her it's time to go home, reminding her that people aren't there to see her, they're there to see Noah. Right before she leaves, though, she asks to feed Noah, and Alanis gets pissed off that Serena didn't prepare a bottle, but she has no choice. Serena, along with the maid that works in the Wheeler household, heads to the very back of the building so that Serena can feed her child. She asks the woman for some privacy, and it looks like the woman knows exactly what's going to happen once she leaves, but she agrees to it, leaving Serena alone. And as soon as she is alone, she runs out of the back of that building with her child, almost getting hit by a car, but finding one girl that is willing to let her get in driving off, and escaping. And in the season finale, June has survived the shooting, but she's also taken precautions against a future shooting. She's bought a bulletproof vest. The good news is she gets a visit from Mark Tuello that lets her know that they caught the gunman. He was just an angry guy with a gun, and if he has any ties to Gilead, they'll find him. June walks Mark to his car, and she asks him how he's doing, which he really appreciates because nobody seems to check in on Mark. But June knows what it's like to have people that she's responsible for that end up passing away. She says her goodbye to Mark, and then she starts looking around the neighborhood. Nothing really seems out of the ordinary until she starts walking back to her house. And that's when a truck starts to slowly follow her, making himself known that he's doing so. When June takes off running, the truck speeds up and he hits her. He then runs over her arm, breaking it, and it looks like he's about to back up on her and kill her, And that's when Luke runs outside and beats the ever-loving hell out of this guy. And it's worth noting that he had a Gilead bumper sticker. So this was absolutely targeted. They then rush June to the hospital and Luke is trying to figure out if his wife will be okay. Looks like she will be, but he has to go talk to the police because he did assault a guy. But word of June's attack has gotten all the way to Gilead. The shooting reached Gilead and Nick tried to talk to Commander Lawrence about it, but the way that Commander Lawrence looked at it, well, this is war. And casualties happen in war. He didn't really seem to care all that much. When Nick found out about the hit, he knew he had to take matters into his own hands. He got in touch with Mark Tuello, or Mark got in touch with him. But either way, they meet up at the border, and they come to an agreement. Mark takes Nick to the hospital to see June, who is sleeping at the time. He explains to him what happened, but also the fact that Luke is currently talking to the police. And as soon as he's done talking to the police, he will be escorted over to June's room, so... There's not a whole lot of time for Nick to talk to June if he's going to do it. Mark decides to give June and Nick some privacy, and Nick just touches her hand, kisses her on the forehead, and then leaves. He then heads back to the border with Mark, and Mark makes him sign a contract for their agreement. Nick tells him, I'll keep my end of the deal, you just keep her safe. Gilead's not going to stop. They're going to keep coming after her, and then her baby, and then her family. So I need to know that you're going to protect her. Mark reassures him that he'll do everything he can, but Nick is a little skeptical on that. He then heads back over to Gilead, where in Gilead, Aunt Lydia has a conundrum. She's been told by another one of the ants that people have noticed she's given preferential treatment to Janine and she needs to post her. She figures the best place to post her would be at the Lawrence's place. That way, Janine can see her baby. She first talks to Mrs. Putnam about this, and Mrs. Putnam is a little skeptical on letting Janine back in the house. She feels like she'll be laughed at for doing so, but ultimately, Aunt Lydia convinces her to give her at least a try. Aunt Lydia then goes and talks to Janine about it, but Janine really doesn't have any interest. She tells Aunt Lydia, you told me I didn't have to do this anymore. And Aunt Lydia explains, well, no, I didn't say that. You do need to do it. She then starts spinning it as this is the only way to see her daughter consistently. So the next day, there's going to be the wedding of Mrs. Putnam and Commander Lawrence. And this is the first time that Mrs. Putnam and Janine are seeing each other. Mrs. Putnam lays down the law, telling Janine that 
The baby is actually with her parents all summer. They're going to bring Janine in, but on a trial basis. And if she behaves herself, then they'll think about letting her stay. Janine plays her part. She's very respectful, thanking Mrs. Putnam the whole way. But when Mrs. Putnam goes and takes pictures, one of the Marthas comes up to Janine and lets her know what happened to June. This completely changes Janine's entire mood. So much so that when Mrs. Putnam says to Janine, it'll be nice to have a friendly face around here, Janine snaps, telling her that they're not friends, how much she hates Mrs. Putnam, how Mrs. Putnam is an idiot for not even noticing it. It completely takes Mrs. Putnam off guard, and this awkward conversation only ends when Mrs. Putnam gets called away by Commander Lawrence. Janine is then taken back to the handmaid's barracks, and she's dressed down by Aunt Lydia. But Aunt Lydia, the whole time, is trying to think of a way where they can salvage this. In doing so, though, all of a sudden, a bunch of eyes come in and arrest Janine. Aunt Lydia tells the eyes, I'm going to go talk to Commander Lawrence about this, and they let her know Commander Lawrence is the one who gave the order. And that is shocking to Aunt Lydia. There's nothing really she can do about it. She follows the eyes along with Janine out to the van the whole time trying to plead her case until eventually the eyes push her down. They take Janine along with another Martha who was already in the van and they take her away. But back at the Lawrence house, they continue to celebrate the wedding of Commander Lawrence and Mrs. Putnam. Nick is a little late to arrive because, you know, he was over in Toronto visiting his girlfriend who was hit by a car And he storms on into the house and slaps the crap out of Commander Lawrence. Yelling at him, you could have killed her. Commander Lawrence pleads his innocence saying that it wasn't him, but it's quite a sight. Nick tries to take off. Commander Lawrence tries to play it off like no big deal. But ultimately, Nick is arrested. The only person that comes to visit him is Rose. And she basically lets him know, it's over. I can't be with you because you clearly don't love me. If you did love me, you wouldn't drop everything every time your girlfriend calls and to go run to her. Ultimately, Rose just doesn't understand and Nick has a really hard time explaining the situation, but Nick is left alone. The next day, June is discharged. She gets to go home and her and Luke have this conversation about what they're going to do to protect themselves. It's pretty clear they're really not safe anymore in Toronto. Everybody hates refugees and it's got Luke carrying around a gun. June then lays down to get some rest, but when she wakes up, she does so to a bunch of commotion. And the commotion is because the guy that Luke beat up, the same guy that hit June, well, he died, which means that Luke is going to be arrested because Luke killed a Canadian citizen on Canadian soil and he's just a refugee. Everybody's kind of freaking out, trying to figure out what to do until finally June says, we need to run. Look, we waited way too long in Boston until it was too late. We couldn't run. We need to get out of here now. Country isn't what it was. They don't want us here. We need to leave. And this speech ends up working. Moira and Rita help June and Luke pack up things, and they start putting stuff in their car to get the hell out of there and get to the airport with plans on going to Hawaii. But as they're doing so, they get stopped by Mark Tuello in their driveway. He tells them that Luke's name is going to be flagged as soon as they get to the airport. So it's stupid to go there. There's no point. But the American government is shuttling out refugees and sending them out west. They're doing so on trains. And he can get them on one of those trains. So they agree. Mark drives them to the train station, drops them off, gives them new visas because as soon as they see Luke Bankhold, they're going to arrest them. And he sends them on their way. But right before she leaves, June tells Mark, send a message to Nick. Tell him that I'm safe. I'll be okay. June and Luke then head into the train station, and it's a scene that looks a lot like when they were trying to leave Boston. A lot of people trying to get the hell out of Dodge, overcrowdedness, and just fear. But when they reach the train, Luke tells June, go ahead, because if they catch me with you, they're going to arrest all of us. So you go ahead, and I'll try to get on this train without them noticing me. June is very hesitant to do so, but ultimately she does. She goes ahead, she gives her ID, And she's waiting by the train for Luke. But then she starts hearing police asking other people if they know of Luke Bankhold, if they've seen him before. And she knows it's going to be really hard for him to get on that train. She calls him up and tells him that he's got to come now, but he says, no, June, you're not safe with me. And you're not safe in Toronto. So you need to get on that train and go. Take Nicole, go out west. We found each other before, we'll find each other again. June then realizes that this was Luke's plan all along. He was never going to get on the train. 
but he was making the sacrifice to protect June and Nicole. Ultimately, he calls over the police, and they arrest him, and June gets on the train. She then starts looking around, figuring out where she's going to sit, and she hears another baby crying, and that baby is Noah, Serena's baby, because Serena is also on the train. The two women have a little bit of an awkward hello, but you figure they're going to be talking a lot because they're on this train ride for a long time together. And that is the end of Season 5 of The Handmaid's Tale. Thank you so much for getting to this point. Please consider subscribing to the channel. Hit thumbs up if you liked it. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought it sucked. I have a Patreon. I have merch. I have shirts. I have memberships. I have all that. Buy it. Don't. I don't care. But thanks for watching.